funny thing about this matchup tonight in Cleveland, this opponent stinks, obviously. And at the same time, I really don't care if it ends up being some sort of close call or whatever. Good afternoon to you. Good Thursday afternoon. Happy game day. I'm Dayan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is the new Double Shot show that comes your way every afternoon. I'll, of course, be at the Brown Stadium tonight covering it. We'll be back with another one of these tomorrow to discuss how it plays out. And I'm going to tell you in advance that however it plays out, so long as the Steelers take care of business, get the W, ideally come out of there without any additional injuries, which is always a challenge on a short week like this, then that's fine. That's just awesome. I said something similar last week regarding the matchup with the Ravens. Not just because Steelers versus Ravens is always decided by two or three points or whatever, but because you do reach a stage of the season. You reach a stage of your evolution as a football team where you're not necessarily looking for you know intangible leaps in performance. You're just looking for, did we win or did we not win? That's what they need to do tonight. That's the mindset that they need to take into this game. Would it be awesome if they smoked the team or whatever? Sure. Would it fit kind of what everybody's been doing to the Browns? Yeah. I mean, this is this is a 2-8 and eight team on merit. They've got two wins. One of them was in the second week down in Jacksonville. Obviously, the Jaguars have turned out to be terrible. And the other one was just that ridiculously high emotion uh, Jameis Winston debut where they all felt like they had an albatross removed from the scene by not having Deshaun Watson to worry about anymore. But otherwise, I mean, these scores, I'm, I'm looking at them here on my laptop. You're talking about you know, routinely 34 points. This is what they've allowed, 20, 21, 29 uh, 27, 35 to the Saints last week. It's not a good team. And they might be even lesser offensively. So go there, take care of business, get out of there clean, admire the standings the next day, and enjoy the long weekend before getting ready for some other opponent. It, it just, I, I, I don't want to make too much of this. I don't want to talk down something because I know that makes all of you cringe. You, you start thinking, ah, oh, you can't say that. You're jinxing this and that or as if we're all still in fourth grade. It's a bad opponent. This opponent stinks. Go and take care of them. If that ends up being 10 to 9, go and take care of them. When we come back, Chris Halleck. At DK Pittsburgh Sports, we take pride in coverage that connects our city's fans to their favorite teams. Now, that connection's stronger than ever. Introducing our all-new state-of-the-art app. Find expert inside reporting and original podcasts. Check live box scores. Track the latest stats. Chat it up with our community of thousands of fans, all in one place. The new app from DK Pittsburgh Sports. Coverage that connects. Joined now by Chris Halleck. Chris, the Cleveland offense, it's been kind of difficult to gauge over the course of this season because, well, one, obviously they had Deshaun Watson and then they didn't. Jameis Winston comes in and replaces him. They didn't have Nick Chubb, and now they do, but he's not necessarily Chubb. They don't have the offensive line. It's, it's a tough read, isn't it? Yeah, it really is because, you know, Going into this game, if Deshaun Watson were still the quarterback, it'd be pretty easy because, well, this offense was pretty absolutely awful with Deshaun Watson at quarterback. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was terrible. Statistically, one of the worst quarterbacks in the league before he got injured. And Jameis comes in, and immediately they beat the Ravens. It's like, okay, let's pay a little closer attention. Then they, you know, kind of they, they go out there. He throws three interceptions against the Chargers, and then you know this fast game. <laughs> Then this past game, that's, they, that's Jameis. So that's always been Jameis. Yeah, uh, but yeah, and, everywhere he's been. And that's the thing is that you know, big time win over the Ravens. 
go out. Now, uh, uh, granted, facing a good Chargers team, but throw three picks and lose and then contend with the Saints. Now, granted, it's the Saints, but contend with the Saints for three quarters and then completely fall apart and they allow three touchdowns in the fourth quarter and and it looks like a blowout. But it's still been a team from what I've seen over the last couple of games. They're they're playing a little they're showing a little bit more fight than they were when Deshaun Watson was at quarterback. And I think that's the thing that kind of, I mean, that's, that's Jameis. Yeah. That's what that is. I mean, you saw the NFL films thing. I'm sure before that game against the Ravens, Mm -hmm. what he was saying to those guys on the sideline, that was the first game that he took over for Watson. And I mean, you're, you're ready to run through a brick wall for him. Yep. You know, I mean, he was unbelievable, and he does a lot of that, too, and he's really, really good at it, by the way. Yes, he is. <laughs> but that's only going to get you so far. Mm-hmm. And I look at I look at this offense, and the first thing that I think is, all right, Mr. Chubb, as Mike Tomlin has designated him, one of his various misters here, he can't, can't, can't be the same. I'm sorry. We all saw what happened when Minka Fitzpatrick fell into his knee. Yeah. That that's just it's. I mean, I'm I'm so glad he's back because that was such an awful sight mm-hmm. when it occurred. But we're talking about through four games, a 53 carries for 163 yards. That's a 3.1 average, Chris. Along a 15, one touchdown. That's not Nick Chubb. No, it's not. And now, I mean, to be fair, the offensive line has not been great, but still, he's run behind some still. some not so great offense. Now, they've typically had a good offensive line while he's been the running back there, but. Just watching, yeah, he, he does. He looks like he's still kind of getting his legs under him, and, and it's just, it's. You're right. It's not the same Nick Chubb. Now, granted, Mm-mm. Steelers can't go into this game automatically assuming that they're going to get sixty percent of Nick Chubb. They have to go in assuming that Nick Chubb is going to be Nick Chubb uh, or Mister Chubb, as Mike Tomlin, like you said, likes to, likes to call him. And that's what they're going to prepare for. They're going to prepare for that. That also doesn't mean they're going to overlook Jerome Ford. Mike Tomlin is very aware of what Jerome Ford did against them when, when Chubb went out last year. So he, 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 he raked the Steelers. Yeah. I mean, he really did. It was, it was rough. Uh, but then again, when you're talking about targets, passing targets, you know, Jerry, Judy, I understand he's on his second life now and, and whatever else he's got 39 catches on 72 targets. That is a really low rate. Yeah. Uh, 560 yards is is okay. Two touchdowns isn't impressive. David and Joku, who I've always really liked, like as a football mm-hmm. player, and always thought he had more potential than what he's shown on the field, is at 39 catches, which isn't that different than Pat Fryermoose. And we all think that Fryermoose not being targeted anywhere near enough. I, I don't I don't see where the Cleveland offense is gonna just rise up. I, I really don't. I don't see which of these names that I've mentioned here is going to say, all right, here it comes. We're going to now trample the you know number two defense in the National Football League. Yeah, I don't see the Browns necessarily racking up a lot of points in this game, but what they can do, and when I was going through the numbers, especially on you know the offense on Jameis Winston, there was a number that really leapt out to me. That was Jameis Winston throwing out a play action. He's got a 150, 150.4 passer rating throwing out a play action right now. Wow. That's massive. That, okay. So who runs to make that possible? That's the point. It's, it's got, yeah. I mean, that's the point. Yeah. I, I think between Chubb and Ford, look, I mean, we've seen the Steelers occasionally give up running plays. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we'll see them give up running series, which drives you even more nuts. Yep. Someone will just choo, 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 down the field on them. But I can't be convinced that that's not something the Steelers can patch up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and that's why it's so important that they have to keep the Browns one dimensional. They have to shut down the run, not allow Nick Chubb to turn into Mr. Chubb, not allow Jerome Ford to gash them like he did last year. Keep a bottle on the running game. Make Jameis Winston beat them in the drop back game because he is significantly worse when he's throwing, when he's just dropping back in the pocket and trying to make throws. That's where you're going to find the mistakes. He's going to try to make things happen, and he may hit on a, on a few of those throws, but he also makes some mistakes and throw throw into some double coverages or not see a certain guy and throw it right to a defender. Whatever it is, he'll make mistakes if you let him. The problem is, is that if the, you let the Browns get their running game going. Then Jameis Winston can throw out a play action, and he has been absolutely dynamite. Granted, three game sample size, well, three start sample size, but still, he's 
hitting big time numbers and big time efficiency throwing out a play action. So they have to limit the run. And I'm checking the injury reports and uh, the left tackle uh, situation uh, is the, is the, the big yeah, one. it's, it's as Jedrick Willis is going to be out with the knee injury. He will not play tonight in Cleveland. And you know what that opens up for, Nick Herbig on that side. Uh, I don't know. Nobody wants to hear this stuff. See, that's how this goes, Chris. Like you want to, you, you you sound like you're talking down the opponent. Everyone thinks like that. We're, you know, symbolically, we're as if we're the Steelers talking down on them. Well, we're not. Yeah. You know, we can say this stuff. You can say this stuff. They can't. Right. It's a little different. Yeah, and not only not only it will Wills be out, but Dewan Jones just got placed on injured reserve. So their top two options at left tackle are now out. So they're going to be down to their number three option at left tackle. That makes that line sign like significantly weaker. Uh, the rest of the line hasn't played. And like Batonio is a really really good guard, but outside of that, like the offensive line's just been really lacking. It's tough, and so that that. Again, this should be a game in which we, we talk about should. This should be a game that the Steelers are able to put a put a cap on the run, make Jameis wins, make them one dimensional, make Jameis Winston beat them from the pocket. If that's the case, then yeah, I don't see the Browns scoring a lot of points in this game. I just don't. Dewan Jones, from the time that he was draft eligible out of Ohio State, I can't even hear his name without thinking about how he is, and he's currently listed as six eight. 374. This is truly an offensive tackle who only has to exist yeah. to be effective. <laughs> he just, he just, they just give him a helmet, a uniform, and they say, son, this is where you stand. Oh, that's all you got to do. When we talk about all the player or all the players that Mike Tomlin's been uh, infatuated with during senior bowls and uh, pro days and stuff like that, this is one. Dewan Jones was one of them. He was right there in the mix when Dewan Jones was going through one on one reps. Uh, down in Mobile at the Senior Bowl. I remember covering that. He was all over Dewan Jones, just everywhere he was going. Mike Tomlin was just following him around. It was funny. Kind of hard to miss, but he will be missed tonight. When we come back, J1Q. Safety is a habit. Gun safety and responsible storage are no different. Help prevent gun accidents, misuse, and theft. Keep firearms safe and secure when not in use. For safe storage options, visit projectchildsafe.org. And for today's J1Q, we head to Chris Davis in Tavares, Florida. Hey, DK. My name is Chris, and I'm from Florida. My J1Q is in regards to Pat Fryer move. When you go back and review the film, are defenses taking him away? Or is it just that he's not getting as many targets as we were expecting? Thank you. He's not getting those targets, Chris. And as you could probably see from my expression, this isn't something that sits well with me. I don't understand before I even get into how I feel about it. I don't even comprehend how you as a football team and your coaching staff and everybody spends the better part of their summer planning for this individual to be your second most important receiving target. And then you don't use him when he's been effective 31 catches on 36 targets is a really good ratio i understand tight ends usually have better ratios than wide receivers because the complexity of the routes and the deep ball and all that other stuff here but still but still 31 of 36 is nice he's averaging 9.5 yards per catch also nice he's got 16 catches for first downs really nice you would think that this would be imperative, not just a pleasant option, but imperative for this offense. Instead, what you're seeing is that Fryermuth was on the field for 45 snaps Sunday against the Ravens. Darnell Washington also on the field for 45 snaps. So are they the same status right now? Darnell was targeted twice as often. He was targeted four times, Muth twice. 
Can they coexist? Can you have both of them out there at the same time? Why was Michael Pruitt out there as much as he was in Landover and he was getting targeted? Uh, look, I understand and respect the value of blocking. I understand and respect Arthur Smith's requirement, and that's what it is, that if you're going to be on the field with this offense, you're either going to block or you're not going to play. That even goes to George Pickens to an extent. But I don't understand not having this player on the field just from the receiving standpoint. I really don't. You cannot convince me that, Fryermuth is less valuable to you on the football field than, say, for example, a Calvin Austin or a Van Jefferson. You can't. You can't. I don't think you can convince anybody of that. He could be a subpar or even an outright disinterested blocker, and he's not either of those things. And he would still bring more to your offense than what either of those two do. He can be a, a threat going to the sideline. He can be a threat over the middle, even though I know that's not Russell Wilson's favorite area to throw to. He can be a deep threat. These passes, we've been saying this since the opener in Atlanta, that they've been trying for Connor Hayward and Darnell downfield. Almost none of these go to Pat, and yet he's the one who's capable of catching those. Yeah, I, I take a lot of pride in trying to give you the best answers that I've got. I don't have one. I don't have one. I'd like to think that tonight in Cleveland, this is going to be the breakout game for Friar Muth. Here it comes. This is the one. There's going to be uh, all kinds of talk about how they've been saving this one for a divisional. I don't know. I don't expect it. I don't see a reason to expect it. I don't get it. I don't know what they're doing in this regard. I nonetheless appreciate the question because it's very much a subject worth bringing up. We're going to have another one of these tomorrow, wrapping up tonight's game between the Steelers and the Browns.